Hi everybody, in this video I'm going to continue on with my introduction to moments and rotational equilibrium. This is part two of a video series. This may be the last video, maybe another one after this, but we're talking about force and stability. This is activity 5.7 currently for Project Lead the Way's Introduction to Engineering Design course. So we finished off last time with a, with a problem dealing with rotational equilibrium and solving for an unknown distance. And the thing we need to keep in mind when we take force times distance is equal to force times distance. In other words, counterclockwise moments equal clockwise moments is that we can use this same problem solving strategy for every single problem involving rotation, including questions like this. What if the levers bend at an angle? Right. So what if we have a situation like this, where instead of having a flat seesaw, the second end, the right end is bent upwards at a 90 degree angle. How far does that force that's applied upward at the top, how far away from the fulcrum does it need to be applied in order for that system to be in rotational equilibrium? Now, we are making the assumption that there's like a linchpin. There's something here that's going to keep this from sliding off the fulcrum. OK, but the nice thing is this. We know that if the black arrow was the only arrow that existed, OK, that it would force a counterclockwise rotation. So we have a counterclockwise moment from the black arrow. It is at a force of 15 pounds and a distance of 5.5 inches away from the fulcrum. We also know that if the red arrow were the only force that existed, that it would force clockwise rotation. So we have a force of 36 and two thirds pounds, but we don't know the distance that it needs to be applied because the perpendicular distance in this case, the 90 degree angle would be this vertical direction now as opposed to the horizontal one from the last time. So the nice thing is force downward. We have a distance this direction and they are at right angles to each other. We have a force to the right. We have an up and down distance vertical and we have a perpendicular arrangement here. Okay, so we can say then the counterclockwise moment is equal to the clockwise moment because it's not rotating. So the force times the perpendicular distance in each case still holds. We set up our math and it turns out to be exactly the same as the last example that we did with just a flat first class lever seesaw. So it doesn't matter whether the arm is bent or not at a 90 degree angle, what matters is do we have a force and can we find the perpendicular, the 90 degree distance from that force down to wherever the rotation occurs? Okay, we still get 2.25 inches. It's the exact same problem. Okay, so let's go talk about an example for this class. We're gonna talk about tipping force in this lesson. And we're going to talk about stability of objects due to that tipping force. So the question might look something like this. What force, T, is going to be the letter we use to represent it, T for tipping force, must be applied at the top of a 200-pound file cabinet in order to tip it over? The file cabinet's 4 feet tall, and it's 16 inches wide in the direction of tipping. So in other words, what we know is this. We're going to define where we apply the force as where the blue arrow is located here. We're going to represent that tipping force with the letter T, and that's what we're going to solve for in this particular equation. Now, assuming that the, t the file cabinet can't slide, which is what one of the assumptions we're going to have to make here, what we could probably guess then is down in the bottom right corner where that red dot is located, that's where the tipping point would actually be located. That's where the fulcrum would be, the rotational point. Okay. So with that in mind, we, uh, we can move forward, okay? We know, for instance, that the, whole, the, the 90 degree perpendicular distance between the force that's applied and the distance down to where the tipping is actually located is four feet, okay? The 90 degree angle happens right there. You can see the 90 degree angle forming, okay? Now, let's look at this. This is the symbol for center of gravity. Okay, that little symbol you see in the middle, center of gravity. And if we know where the center of gravity is located, which is going to be symmetrical, it's going to be the very center for a symmetrical object like a file cabinet, halfway over and halfway up. Okay, what we know is that 200 pounds that we were talking about, that weight is a force. And really, we can think of its application as being applied at the center of gravity, the center mass. So what we can do is we can say now we have a downward force of 200 pounds. And we also know its location because if it's halfway, that means that it's only now 16 inches across. That means it's 8 inches, half of that distance to the rotational point of equilibrium, like the, ful the fulcrum. Okay, so now let's put it all together. We have T 
that's applied at a distance of 4 feet perpendicularly from the rotational point, and we have a force of 200 pounds that's applied 8 inches away from the fulcrum. Now, if the tipping force was the only thing that was located on this object, it would cause it to spin clockwise. If this center of gravity, this weight of the object, were the only thing, and ignore the floor, by the way, ignore the floor underneath it. If it were the only thing being applied here, then it would cause it to spin counterclockwise. So we have a clockwise moment, and we have a counterclockwise moment, and the tipping force, the tipping point, would be located at what is the exact amount of weight that I would need to push with, the amount of, amount of pounds of force I need to push with in order to get it to start tipping, okay? So it's a, it's a force times distance problem on both sides. What we do is this. Oh, by the way, notice here that we do have an issue before we move forward, okay? If I'm using pounds to describe the weight, that means I'm going to talk about pounds of force here for tipping force. But if I'm talking about 8 inches, then I need to be consistent and talk about 4 feet and inches as well. Or I need to take this and convert it to feet. One or the other. I've got to be consistent in how I use my descriptions for distances. So I think in this case it's easier to take 4 feet and say ah, it's 48 inches instead. Okay. So now let's set up our equation now that we've got that in mind. Okay. Counterclockwise moment is equal to clockwise moment. So force times distance is equal to force times distance. We have T applied at a distance of 48 inches is equal to 200 applied at a distance of 8 inches. A little bit of math, two time, 200 times 8 is 1600. I divide out the 48 and I end up with a force of 33.33 pounds. Now that doesn't seem like much, but a couple of things to remember. Number one, 16 inches is not a very wide uh, file cabinet. I would guess that if you went and measured, you'd probably find file cabinets actually way more than that, or, or wider than that. And the other thing is, 200 pounds for a file cabinet, I mean, that thing is probably close to empty, okay? It's not, it doesn't have a whole lot into it, because a full file cabinet is going to weigh a lot more, okay? But 33.33 pounds is where, if you apply that much force at that location, that's where it's going to start to tip over, okay? So, that's what we're talking about. Things that might affect the tipping force, and then we'll be done. Okay, what would actually affect T and how much I would need to tip things over? There's only a few th factors. Three, in fact. One of them is, how high up did you apply the tipping force in this case, right? If I applied the force lower, that would make a difference. If the file cabinet was 20 feet tall and I pushed it at the top of the 20 foot, um, you know, file cabinet, that would also make a difference. Okay, so where, what is the height in this case of the applied tipping force? Where is the center of gravity of the object? Because if that 8 inch value changed, okay, if this was an off-centered weight, that would make a huge difference, okay? And then also, what's the weight of the object? You fill that thing up or you just load it up with papers on the bottom, on the bottom drawer, that's going to it's going to make a huge difference, right? If this thing weighed 1,000 pounds instead, it's going to be much harder to tip over. So those are the three things that you can do in order to affect, then, the tipping force required to knock something over. So hopefully that makes sense. That's a lot of information to take in in these two videos. But, um, you know, that it's, I really want to try to demystify this tipping force and how it's working and, and how to apply it, okay? Um, if you have any questions and you're in my class, do not hesitate to ask. Otherwise, it's time to go solve some homework problems.